All right, so this is the Unit 1 Biochemistry Review. This is the final review before the AP Bio exam. Your AP exam is in 10 calendar days. It is in um, eight school days. Let's go ahead and get started. First thing I like to do is the difference between polar and nonpolar. If something is polar, it actually has charges. Um, we use the word polar to describe things that are opposite, like night and day, polar opposites, North Pole, South Pole, polar opposites. Boy, that, how can that guy and that girl be in a relationship? They're polar opposites. Well, in chemistry, polar opposites are charges, positive and negative. If something is polar, it is actually charged. It has a positive end and it has a negative end. Nonpolar molecules are uncharged. They don't have a positive or negative. Think about it. They're, they have no poles. They're nonpolar. If something is polar, it's typically considered hydrophilic. This means that it can interact with water because water is also polar. Nonpolar molecules are hydrophobic. They do not interact with water. Water is typically considered uh, the universal solvent because it is polar. It can dissolve anything else that is polar. The only thing it cannot dissolve are things that are nonpolar. When I was a kid, my dad and I were, were replacing a window, and once we got the window installed, we peeled off the manufacturer's sticker, and I tried to wash it off with uh, water. It wouldn't come off because the sticker had glue. Glue is nonpolar. Water would not wash it off. You had to have some a nonpolar cleaner like uh, like Goo Gone or something that could wipe off something that's nonpolar. Uh, molecules for water, or excuse me, molecules that are polar are asymmetrical in shape. Nonpolar molecules are symmetrical. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Some examples of nonpolar substances are things like fats, and oils, waxes. Um, all of those are going to be nonpolar. Water will not mix with them. Let's see if there's anything else I'm missing. Um, ooh, something that's polar has uneven charges. Uneven electron sharing is actually the proper word. So what do I mean by uneven electron sharing? Well, in my own personal opinion, I think that chemistry should be mandated as a prereq for this class because of conversations like this. Let's say I have a water molecule, H2O, just like this. Oxygen has six valence electrons, while hydrogen has one valence electron. That's not even. That would be like if we go out for lunch and I pay for 75% of your food. That is uneven. This means that the side that has more electrons is gonna be negative, and the side that has fewer electrons is gonna be positive. That is what makes it polar. And finally, things that actually have a charge, like I said earlier, like a hydrogen ion, which you see a lot in this class. A hydrogen ion is polar because you can clearly see it has a charge. Even if something negative, like um, a fluorine ion, that would be polar because it has a charge to it. Well, if polar molecules have uneven sharing of electrons, polar molecules have even or equal, let's say equal, equal sharing. of electrons. An example could be like uh, chlorine, Cl2, chlorine gas. Each chlorine has seven valence electrons. So seven equals seven. If I have two chlorines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then I have another chlorine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's equal. And so that would be nonpolar. There is not one that's more positive or negative than the other. Okay?
Lastly, polar and nonpolar don't mix. Not gonna happen. They do not mix with each other. This is why polar molecules like a hydrogen ion or water cannot go through a plasma membrane because the plasma membrane is mostly made out of fat. That's nonpolar. Polar molecules can't go through it. Any questions in here? Any questions online? Be sure you, if you have a question, you send me a chat. The next topic I'd like to go over are intermolecular forces. I'm gonna draw a bunch of water molecules here. Okay, guys, the black bonds I just drew are called intramolecular forces. In Latin, when we took our Latin quizzes, you learned that intra means within. If you were to take an intra-national flight, then you are gonna go within from, you're gonna fly within that country. So these are gonna be um, within the molecule. So all those black ones that are holding the, the oxygen to the hydrogen on the respective water molecules, those are actually covalent bonds. Those covalent bonds hold one molecule together. But these are hydrogen bonds. These are known as intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces Uh, they bond neighboring molecules to each other. Whenever you boil water, the hydrogen bonds are the ones that break. They're the ones that, they can absorb a lot of energy, but eventually they reach their breaking point and they can't uh, maintain themselves any further. So just hypothetically, everybody, if you look here, Let's say I cranked up the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius, which is when water boils into a, a vapor. Those, are, those water molecules are now no longer bonded to each other. They're free to go wherever they want. That's a characteristic of, of gases. But let's say that I cool down the air temperature. The water molecules that are now as a gas are going to slow down. And they're going to start to move closer to, to each other. And they get closer to each other. They're going to reestablish their bonds. And they're going to condense into a liquid. This is what happens in the upper atmosphere. It gets cold enough to where the, the gas slows down to where they can grab onto each other again. And that's called condensation. Now, this is also a phenomenon of positive to negative. Hydrogens have a partial positive charge. This symbol here that I'm drawing is um, the lowercase letter delta in Greek, but for science, it means partial. Oxygen is a partial negative charge. Hydrogen is a partial positive charge. This is what makes water polar, positive end and a negative end. If you look here, uh, let me draw a couple more. The negative oxygens bond to the positive hydrogen of another water molecule. It's always oxygen of one molecule to the hydrogen of another molecule. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's talk about the properties of water.
Okay. Um, when it comes to water, its solid form is less dense than its liquid form. So if you ever go to a frozen lake, what part of the lake is uh, actually frozen? Just the top. So let's say this is an actual lake. Here's the surface. If that surface is actually frozen over like so, all the fishies underneath can still swim about and not be frozen like a bunch of ice cubes because only the top of the water is actually frozen. Now, some fish got caught up here. Yeah, they, they're going to be frozen at the very top. But, um, you know, in Georgia, in Louisiana, where alligators are also found, whenever it gets so cold that the lakes will freeze, you'll see an alligator stick his little snout out the surface. So he'll be frozen in the water, but he'll still be able to breathe. It's like a torbid state where they, they're kind of like Captain America frozen in time. And then when the water melts, they'll be alive. They can still breathe. But the point here, why we talk about water in biology is because whenever a body of water um, is exposed to really cold temperatures, only the surface is going to freeze. So all the life that's underneath is still going to be able to swim around. A few other properties of water that you should know. Keep in mind that it is polar. This is why we call it the universal solvent. It can dissolve anything else that is also polar. Um, it has very high specific heats. A high specific heat means that water can absorb a tremendous amount of energy without actually changing its own temperature. This is also very important for, very important for, our, for us because here on Earth, we are more than two-thirds water. Our body, our blood, our um, juices, our secretions, our tissues, most of us is water. And so if we are in an environment where the climate is used to drastic temperature changes like the desert, at night, a desert can be borderline freezing. And during the day, it could be like one of the hottest places on Earth. That would be very tough for life if our internal temperature is having to go back and forth from really high to really low temps. But because we're mostly water, our body will resist those changes because it can absorb that energy without changing itself. Uh, water is a high heat of vaporization. When it leaves our body, when we sweat, it cools us down. So it loses a lot of heat when it vaporizes. Uh, it has high surface tension. That was a problem from yesterday's review. Water is actually very sticky. And so the surface can actually hold on pretty well. Uh, water is adhesive and cohesive. Adhesive means it sticks to other polar surfaces. And cohesive means it sticks to other water. Imagine one if you walked into my classroom and you had dirt all over the bottom of your shoe and I asked you to clean it up. If you just got a dry paper towel and try to clean it up, it's going to be pretty tough. But if you got your paper towel wet, you're, you'll be able to mop that up real easy because water is actually pretty sticky. It can stick to anything else that is also polar. All right. So that's some of the basic chem. We did that like on the first day of class way back in September. Let's get started into the biochem, the biomolecules. These are also called macromolecules. The first macromolecule that we're going to do are carbohydrates. The elements that are found in the carbohydrate 
is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the ratio is typically one to two to one. So if you are looking at a molecule or you are discussing carbo uh, carbohydrates in any way, the only three elements that you should be referring to are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they are in a one-to-one -one ratio. To give you an example, you have glucose, C6. If there's six carbons, that means that there must be double the amount of hydrogens and the same amount of oxygen, C6H12O6. The monomers are called monosaccharides. You should know that a monomer is a building block. The three monomers that we discussed in class are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Monosaccharide literally translates into one sugar. The polymers, oops, the polymers are called polysaccharides. And poly, the five polysaccharides that we did in class are glycogen, uh, amylose, which is also called starch, cellulose, chitin, and peptidoglycan. Um, one type of sugar I didn't mention here are disaccharides. They're not, they're not a polymer, but they're also not a monomer. They're like, I guess you could say a, a mini polymer. Disaccharide literally means two sugars, and polysaccharide literally means many sugars. The three disaccharides we did in class are sucrose, uh, maltose, and lactose. The two su um, do either of you know what the two monomers are that make up sucrose? It's what and what? Glucose and fructose. Maltose is made up of glucose and glucose. And lactose is made up of glucose and galactose. Okay. Glycan, let, let, and so um, let's talk about what the functions are of the polysaccharides. Glycogen is energy storage. in animals, like us. We store glycogen within our muscles and within our liver. I wanna uh, have you guys keep in mind, uh, check this out, please look. Let's say, you don't need to write this, just look. Let's say that little circle is a glucose molecule, and then another, and another, and another, and another, all bonded together, what am I forming? A polysaccharide. This is what glycogen looks like. We store this in our muscles and our liver. Whenever we need energy and we don't have food readily available, our bodies will release this and it will break the bonds. So we just have a bunch of glucose molecules now. As you can see, I'm erasing those bonds. Is that still glycogen now? No, what is it? Individual monosaccharides. That's right. All right, um, amylose is energy storage in plants, typically in the roots. This is why things like potatoes and french fries and potato chips and carrots um, are very, very starchy. They are complex carbohydrates, lots of sugar in them. Cellulose uh, is plant cell walls. Chitin is found in two places. It's fungi cell walls, and it's found in exoskeletons of 
arthropods. An arthropod is an organism that has an exoskeleton, like a, a crustacean or an arachnid or an insect. And then peptidoglycan is the cell wall of bacteria, which are prokaryotes. Okay. Now, I want to draw for you a molecule that is a carb, and I want you to tell me how you can tell it's a carb. So here it goes. It's going to take me a minute. Okay, how can you tell that that is a carbohydrate? It has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen only. And they are at a one to one ratio. That's one to TWO, one ratio. Now, the another th next thing I want to talk to you guys about is I want to try to copy and paste this, see if I can do that. I'm going to tell you when I get to lipids. That's a good question. How do you know this is not a lipid? I'm going to tell you that. All right, perfect. Let you guys see this. Let's say that I have two monosaccharides here, and I want to link them together. Let me actually flip something here. What do you have to do in order to link two molecules? You have to go through dehydration synthesis. Dehydration synthesis is the removal of water to link molecules. Now, technically, when you have water, water is just a hydrogen ion in a hydroxide ion. Well, I want you guys to look right here. You see that? What did I highlight? So technically, what, did it, what could it be? It's technically water. And so what you do, look at this, you remove that, and these bonds are gonna form. Now, are those two monosaccharides bonded together? Why, why are you shaking your head, Sebastian? Yes, they are. Why were you shaking your head? What do you mean there was only one what? But are they bonded? Yeah. So they're bonded together. This is no longer uh, two monosaccharides. What is this? It's a disaccharide. Now, let's say I wanted to split this up. What's the opposite of dehydration synthesis? Hydrolysis. Look at the words. Hydrolysis means water splitting. This is the addition of water to separate molecules. So what you do, and when I say water, technically that's gonna be hydroxide and hydrogen. Guys, if I add a hydroxide here, look up here. Let's say I add a hydroxide here and a hydrogen there. This bond breaks. And those respective bonds will go back to those ions. These two molecules are now separated. So is the disaccharide still here? No, it has been broken down into individual monosaccharides. That is what happens during hydrolysis. You were asked that on a question yesterday about the hydrolysis of ATP. You add water to break it apart. It, it, whenever you break a bond, it's typically accompanied by an energy release. That's a good point. So dehydration synthesis is normally the addition of energy because you're forming bonds. 
when you break a bond, you're releasing energy. That's a good observation. Okay, so Sebastian was asking, how can we tell that this is a carbohydrate or a lipid? Because he knows that lipids also only have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's all I'm going to get to now. So let's do lipids, number two. Lipids are long-term energy. Um, they're fats, oils, waxes, and steroids. They're nonpolar. So can, can lipids interact with water? No, they cannot. They're, in, they're not soluble in water. We call that hydrophobia. The elements that compose lipids is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And this is how you can tell the difference. So I'm going to put a little asterisk here. When you're looking at lipids, it is not a one to two to one ratio. There's hardly any oxygen. Know the difference between me saying hardly and none. I did not say that there is no oxygen. I said that there's hardly any oxygen. If I said there are no students in my room right now, I would be wrong. There are two students in my room right now. Saying that there are none is an inaccurate statement. So if I saw two oxygens and I said there's no oxygen, that's wrong. There are oxygens there. There's just hardly any of them. So the way that you can tell that these are carbs, Sebastian, not lipids, is you need to look at how many oxygens there are compared to the carbons. If the carbon to oxygen ratio is about one to one, then you know it's a carbon. But if you have like lots of carbon, lots of hydrogen, and maybe like one or two oxygens, then you know it's a lipid, okay? All right, uh, let's see. There are two different types of lipids that we did in this class. We did triglycerides, and we did phospholipids. Triglyceride is bad fat. It's not good. If you go to the doctor and you get your, your yearly physical and they tell you that your triglyceride level is really high, you're eating a lot of junk food, probably a lot of red meat, a lot of dairy, a lot of crap. Um, it's LDL, low-density lipoprotein. It sticks in your blood vessels and it clogs them up. Well, both of these are polymers, okay? So I need to tell you what the monomers are. Both of these are the polymers. Their monomers are a little tricky. It's not as easy as saying that a monosaccharide is a monomer and a polysaccharide is a polymer. It's not that easy. The monomers of a triglyceride is one glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. The monomers of a phospholipid is a phosphate head or a phosphate group and two fatty acids. So here's how it kind of looks. Here's the glycerol. One, two, three. Three fatty acids. A phospholip looks like this. Here's the phosphate, PO4, negative three charge. Two fatty acids. Both of these are nonpolar because of the fatty acids. Um, I want to put something here. Listen to this. Without the fatty acids, The glycerol and phosphate are actually polar. If you took away the fatty acids from glycerol or the fatty acids from the phosphate, they would be, um, they would be polar. 
But once you add those fatty acids, they're nonpolar and they cannot be dissolved in water and water cannot interact with them. Okay, so here's uh, the next one is going to be saturated versus unsaturated fat. Saturated fat versus unsaturated fat. Okay, take a look at the saturated fat first. Here, 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 and here, those are all single bonds. When you look at a saturated fat, there are all single bonds between the carbon. Now, some people will go, but Mr. Thorson, there's a double bond right there. Yes, I see that. But the definition is when there are no double bonds between the carbons, then it is a saturated fat. This is gonna be solid at room temp. This is typically animal fat. Now an unsaturated fat look like this. Does that have an in? No. So here we have a double bond right there that indicates that it is unsaturated. This is liquid room temp. We call this oil. For health purposes, guys, if you're concerned about your health and your blood vessels getting all clogged up, what would be better to put on your bread, butter or oil? Oil, because it will be liquid in your blood vessels and you won't get clogged up. But butter comes from animals. It's a dairy product and it is solid at room temp and it will it, it can clog you up when i was growing up my dad would call like the big cheesy burgers at wendy's or burger king he would call them the artery cloggers because they that's what the cheese and all that stuff goes towards clogs you up all right um i'm going to draw one more molecule for lipids and we're going to move on to proteins and i want to i want to see if you can tell me what this is it's going to take me a minute to draw so Hang tight. You'll see. Okay, based on that, what elements do you see? There's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Is it in a one-to-one -one ratio? No, so what, what type of molecule is this, lipid or, or carb? This would be a lipid. Do you know specifically what lipid it is? No, it's steroid. You could also call it cholesterol. A steroid, which you may hear, you know, Alex Rodriguez from the New York Yankees caught using steroids. What does that mean? Um, it's a hormone. Testosterone in males is nonpolar. Estrogen in females is nonpolar. Estrogen is a steroid. The definition of a steroid is just a fat-based nonpolar hormone. Sex hormones are non polar. All right, moving on. We got 15 minutes left in class, less than 15 minutes. Uh, number three, proteins, also called peptides. Proteins have a wide range of function. Um, I'm not gonna go through all their, their functions, but I wanna get to the main event here, guys. Uh, they're elements. 
is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes what? Sulfur. That's right. You're not always going to see sulfur, but it's pretty likely you will. Their monomers are called what? Uh, amino acids. How many different amino acids are there? There are 20 different amino acids. They have weird names like valine and leucine and lysine and serine and aspartate and phenylalanine and tryptophan. Here's what an amino acid looks like. What elements do you see? Nit carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Um, so the fact that you see nitrogen, what can you determine that it is not? You can tell that it is not a carb or a lipid. And when we get to nucleic acids, you're going to find that they have phosphorus. Do you see phosphorus here? So you know it's not a nucleic acid. Here I have two amino acids, guys. How do I get them to link together to start to, to start to make a protein chain? You dehydrate it. Look at this. You see that? That's basically water. You remove that. When you remove that, what does the carbon and the nitrogen do? They bond. They bond. This is called a peptide bond. Guess what a peptide bond forms? Peptides, easy. A peptide bond forms peptides. Let's say that I was eating a big fat steak and I need to digest all of these amino acids so I can get them into my bloodstream. How do you break that bond? Hydrolysis, you add water, which means you're basically adding a hyd uh, hydroxide on one end and a hydrogen on the other. Very good. All right, the uh, polymers are called peptides. When you have multiple peptides, like multiple chains, that is gonna to lead to a polypeptide. How do proteins get their, how do they achieve their function? Like what do they have to go through? Yeah, they have to be a certain shape and they have to have certain folding to achieve their function. Uh, what happens when a protein is exposed to, to um, hot temps or acidic pHs? It denatures. Now, that's good that you understand what denaturing does. I want to ask, or excuse me, you know, you know what denaturing is. What does denaturing result in? Okay, well, what is the, here's what I was hoping you would say. It um, causes the protein to slow down or stop functioning. So my next question is how? And Sebastian, what is, how does it happen? It's unable to fold properly. So in this class, and you guys have already learned on the AP exam, you can't just say, oh, denatur it denatured. It denatured, which resulted in its inability to achieve its function because it didn't fold properly. You have to get it all out there. Um, keep in mind that enzymes are proteins. They're called biological catalysts. Do catalysts get consumed in a reaction? They do not get consumed in a reaction. Um, what happens if an enzyme is in a, an environment that's too acidic or too hot? It denatures. And if it denatures, what does that result, what does that mean for the enzyme? It doesn't work properly. Why does it not work properly? It's going to be all screwed up. Its shape is going to be messed up. So here's, a, or, yeah, here's an enzyme. What do you call this main part where the substrate fits in? This is the active site. What could fit in here? Or what is that site right here called? The allosteric site. What does an allosteric 
inhibitor do to the enzyme? It stops the enzyme from functioning by doing what? It changes the active site so that a substrate cannot bind to it. Very good. What does an allosteric in, uh, activator do? It changes the shape of the active site, so what's it? What is it? You said it can bind. A substrate can bind to it. So an allosteric activator changes the substrate, so it uh, changes the active site, so a substrate can bind to it. And an allosteric inhibitor changes the substrate, or excuse me, changes the active site, so it can't. Uh, what do you guys call this? Look at this. If this is an enzyme, this right here is a substrate, but this is an inhibitor. You see how they both had to fit in the same spot? Can they both fit in the same spot at the same time? So what type of competition is this? Competitive or non-competitive? This is competitive inhibition. Only one can fit in the seat. It's like musical chairs. This is called competitive inhibition. You cannot have the substrate and the inhibitor in the same spot at the same time. Um, what if I had this? It, would this be competitive or non-competitive? This would be non-competitive inhibition. They don't have to fight for the same spot. The inhibitor and the um, substrate can fit in there at the same time. All right. Um, let's get to the last part for proteins, and I'll finish up with nucleic acids. We're almost out of time. We have primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary. Let's get this straight. Primary is just a sequence of amino acids. It's like a broken gas gorilla necklace. Secondary is where you're, you're starting to get some folding. And there's two types. It can either be an alpha helix, that symbol I just drew is alpha helix, or a beta pleated sheet. A tertiary means you're starting at a 3D shape. It's three-dimensional, and then quaternary is just going to be multiple chains. Hurry up and get that. I have less than five minutes, and I still need to do nucleic acids. It's going to be a close call. Hurry up. Okay, last one. Number four, nucleic acids. They're mainly meant for storing info, like heredity. The elements are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. What are the monomers? Nucleotides. So the last period said amino acids, and I screamed to the ceiling. Remember I told you that yesterday. Don't get confused with that. A nucleotide has three parts. A phosphate group, a pento sugar. If it's RNA, what is the pento sugar? Ribose. If it's DNA, what is the sugar? Deoxyribose. And the fourth part is a nitrogen base. You can also call it a nitrogenous base. They could be adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine, or uracil. The polymers are DNA, or RNA, or ATP. Those are all going to be potential. Um, polymers 
of nucleic acids. And I think that's the one that students may forget the most. Nucleic acids are, you know, deoxyribonucleic acids, ribonucleic acids, it's in the name. Now the last thing I want to do for you all is I want to draw a nucleotide. So here it goes. Okay, what elements do you see? Or second period. What elements do you see? Phosphorus. All right, you may notice that there's no carbons, but I'm going to give you guys a little lesson of organic chemistry. Wherever you see a corner, I'm highlighting here, guess what element that is? That's carbon. Every place you see a corner, that's a carbon. So I see carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, right? Here's the phosphate group, right there. Here's the pentose sugar. I don't know it's pentose, how many sides does it have? Five, that's easy. And then here's the nitrogen base. How do you know it has, it's the nitrogen base, guys? I mean, yeah, duh, it has nitrogen in it. It's pretty simple. Okay, um, I think we're about done. So, yeah, that's about it. So that's it for unit one. Tomorrow, we, the next lesson, we will do unit two, cells, diffusion, and the plasma membrane. That's it.